requires basically I contact media services every time. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to finish up with the weight estimation, the range stuff from last week. I'll make a few more of those. Because um, that's what you're working on in C.7 this week or tomorrow. Um, then we'll move on to regulations. Um, and the reason we're going to finish up with these is this is the bit that's most important right now. And the regulatory aspects will come into play as you get to your configuration design and to your submitting uh, there. Okay? So last week we left off, so join Slido at 9 or, nine or 7, 1, 4, 8, um, and we'll have a different Slido number for the rest. Um, the other thing uh, I've done for week one, I put the Slido, a link to the Slido results, I guess, um, in the week one section of Blackboard on the week by week. So week one, that's week S plus 20. And then after today, I will put this in for uh, week two, just because it's live and don't know if it'll update again. Um, so you can see it all. And then uh, I will also put week three up. Okay. So that was a request someone had made. Okay, so we were asking what the maximum takeoff weight of aircraft A is. Is it 73 tons, 81 tons, 79 tons, or 56 tons? Um, I'll just see how many people join before we move on. I don't expect you to update this. And we'll talk about why we get different answers here. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about why we, why people would get the different answers. Interesting. Oh, lovely. I'm no longer connected to Slido. Useless, useless system. Wind and connection here isn't the best. Uh, it, it is atrocious. I could be out, outside. Well, I am connected because I see things updating, but it's not working. There we go. 
finally worked. Okay. So, what you should be getting is 81 tons. There's actually, you have a choice here, 81 is close enough. Um, technically, you don't count, or typically we don't count the taxi out fuel. So your max takeoff weight is without the taxi out fuel. So if you figure out the taxi out fuel fraction and you multiply that, 0.99, what is it, 995 or whatever, um, and you multiply 81 times by that, you get the, right, the correct answer. But for the purposes of this unit, saving yourself some grief, 81 tons. Now, bottom one here, 56 tons. The reason you would get that is if you only used the cruise right? The cruise weight fraction is 0.79 or something. Well, you divide the payload fraction, all of that, you get 56 tons. That's a big difference. These will come down to including or not including things like reserve, your alternate mission, right, your diversion to your alternate, so that loiter, that 30 minute hold, or whatever it has to be, for <coughs> not a mile. If you're getting around 83 tons, check to make sure you haven't double booked the climb and descent in your cruise, so you're not climbing in a circle with this amazing. Okay? So, these are the quick faults. That one's really obvious. If I see something like that, I know exactly why you've done it. I can find it in your code. I can tell you. These ones are a little bit more insidious uh, and the like. Okay? That's not working. Let's just give up on that. Altogether. Okay, next question. So if I had 300 nautical miles to the range, what happens? And it goes from 81 to 87 tons. It's not too bad. 300 nautical miles to 3,200 is about just under 10%, and this is under 10%. It's just a nice, simple thing. Because range is linear in that sense, uh, or not linear, it diverges. Okay. Obviously, it won't remain the same. We'll do that. Okay, last one. Oh, second to last one. What is the range at max payload? Now, this one requires a little bit of work. All you're doing is you're trading payload fraction for fuel fraction. So max payload is 25 tons versus 16 for our typical design. So I've got to take that extra nine tons of fuel off. All right, you just do a simple payload fraction, leave all of your other segments, except for your cruise the same. Now I know what my cruise weight fraction has to be. Use your brigade range equation to figure out what the range is. And then, remember to add the climb descent credit back on. So if we calculate it straight away, just using that cruise weight fraction, you get 1,100 nautical miles. But that's just the cruise segment. You still have your climb descent. And remember what the climb descent credit is? Yes. 200 nautical miles. In this case, it's 200 nautical miles. So you get your so this is 1,300. Using, so this is using Breguet range equation. Yeah, it's just back to the brigade range equation. Okay? That's all we're using for cruise. 
gay range. Just either with right, solve for range or solve for a weight fraction. Okay, 900. I have a sign error and adding it on. 1700. I've done some other issues. Okay. We need to figure out ferry range on payload range. which is the max fuel weight, which is basically the max fuel volume times the local current density of fuel. However, for this stage of the desired process, you have no way of knowing what your max fuel volume is. Right? It is a decision you get to make, but it is constrained. So we always start with wing fuel, but you haven't yet sized your wing. You don't know how thick your wing is, how large your wingspan is. You have an aspect ratio, but you don't have thickness to core yet. You're not going to do that until after you do the sizing. So you don't know how much space is available in your wing, your center body. You haven't decided how much of your fuselage belly space you want to give up to fuel or use other otherwise. So for this stage, you have two choices. One, you can go look at max fuel volumes for similar aircraft. Right? For aircraft A, what are the similar aircrats again? Yeah, you have my C320, A320, and or the 737. Which 737? It doesn't really matter because dash 800 and dash 8 are about the same, and they're the same as the 500, pardon me, 600, 700, 900, 900 ER, 7, 8, 9, 10. They all have about the same max fuel. You can do that, or I will allow you, no, I will do it, just use your design mission fuel as you're starting. It's a good rough number. If you look at most aircraft and you look at their typical mission, and you look at the fuel, and you look at where it impacts, it intersects the payload range diagram, it's usually pretty close to the max fuel volume. And I mean pretty close, you know, maybe hits it a few hundred nautical miles before, or a few hundred nautical miles after. There are some silly aircraft out there, some of which are very popular. The A330-200 hits its max fuel volume at something like 10% of its design or typical pit. It's got a lot of fuel space. This 777-200LR, which didn't sell so well, same thing. That's because these aircraft are shrimps. They are not the design. An aircraft like the 757-200, it hits its max fuel volume before you put 180 people on. You know, it's a higher pit. So its typical design mission, design range, is a max fuel volume, is beyond the max point of max fuel volume. You're taking it until off. Okay? But in general, it's pretty close. So as a starting point, I would just use that and go from there. Okay. Are there any last questions on this before we move on? Can we use cryogenic super chilled fuel in aircraft like we use it on rockets? Um, 
Good luck. What is it that's different about the way we operate rockets than the way we operate aircraft? Yeah. We burn everything in one fell swoop? No. We go to space? No, that is different. But. Oh, yeah. We use rockets that don't have many moving parts. Okay. No. That's true, but huh? not, not, not why good luck on the crash super chill fuels. By the way, cryogenics is the kind of flavor of the month, because there's everybody's, in Europe especially, is going for LH2 powered aircraft. And it happened um, for lots of reasons anytime soon. Um, and that's cryogenics. What's the limiting factor for using super chilled fuels? <coughs> Who uses super chilled fuels in the rockets? A super chilled is not cryogenic. It is, but it isn't. So SpaceX uses super chilled fuels on the Falcon 9 to put more LOX in the system. They cool their blocks below the liquefaction to get a higher density. Do we put locks in our aircraft? Yeah. Yeah. Now what happens if you super chill kerosene? It freezes? Yeah, it turns to jelly. So you don't want to do that. Uh, but the bigger problem with cryo is we launch Falcon 9s from how many locations? Kennedy Space Center, Cape Renatural Air Station, and Vandenberg Air Force Base. How many airports does an A320 operate out? I don't expect to answer It's a lot. I was about to say untold thousands. Yeah, thousands. So if you're expecting to use that, catching up on the fuel side is the challenge. That, that's the killer with hydrogen. It's actually much easier from an organizational point of view, to solve biofuel production for synthetic, fully synthetic kerosene production than it is to solve the distribution and storage problem uh, of hydrogen across thousands of airports. Um, when we're using the range equation, yes. You do, that's why I gave you cruise altitude. Um, just as a simple starting point, um, and that just helps it. You know, these are first order calculations. You're going to be off by 5-10%. Uh, can you go over the climb traction calculation again? No, because there isn't one. I mean, you can find one. There are ones out there. The climb fraction is just given to you uh, for the exams. Um, if you are willing to find a way and implement Climb fraction in your aircraft design, you will find that that meets the balloon table two requirement. So that gives you an option. That's one of your choices for getting more marks. Um, it's actually not very hard, um, but you do need to look into how TSFC behaves as you climb and accelerate. Okay? Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward to get some. Um, <laughs> okay, I will come back to comments in the trust space in a minute because I, that goes way back. Uh, in the Excel spreadsheet, the guess is 80,000, but W0 is 81,000. The reason the guess is just the guess it comes out to start at that view. Um, what not. What's happening there is the iterator is um, allowing 80,450 and 
12, that's close enough, and then it rounds it out. Um, I'm not going to take you off for 80 or 81 or 80 there, by the way. Um, it's just how the iterator and Excel works. Uh, what fr fractions that use takeoff weight in C.6? Uh, how come the initial guess is used instead of the iterated value? So weight fractions don't require any known starting weight. They are based on the fuel work. The only weight fraction that we need a guess at m tau for is our historically based empty weight fraction. Now, the nice thing is if I have you do a more complex analysis of an aircraft program on exam three, I will give you an empty weight fraction. Maybe 45 percent, 50 percent. So you don't have to do iterations, because iterations are just a way for you to make mistakes when doing it. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that your code does iterations solves that for you. It's kind of like, what's the right way to invert a matrix? Invert a matrix? Yeah. Add joint over the determinant? No. The correct way is don't. Um. In almost all cases, you don't need a precise inversion. You can do a pseudo. Second, best way, you need a proper, precise inversion. Yeah, you can mathematically, correct? Have the computer do it. The third way, if you're asked to do it, say, vibrations exam, is just careful. Because it is all about, the more you do it, the more likely you are to get it wrong, right? So don't do lots and lots of silly calculations. Once you've figured out how to do it, have someone else do it. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, Boeing's trust brace wing. So, this could be the end of today. Um, I'm sorry. So, let's see. How long ago was this? So, this is going back to 2006, seven. NASA started a series of programs. They've been under many names. Um, what was the first version called? Oh, I've forgotten. It became Environmentally Responsible Aircraft Program and like headed up by NASA Aeronautics. Um, the person in charge of overseeing all of this was Faye Collier, uh, who's uh, headed up the, that group at NASA at Langley. Um, and they let a bunch of contracts on different new designs. And one of which was a trust brace wing thing. And um, I didn't work on that, so I didn't screw that up. Um, there was a couple other, because we, we were working with Boeing. I believe it was Virginia Tech, but I wasn't on that program. Um, we also had another one with Boeing for a shorter range aircraft that I was on. And then I can't remember who the third party, and that was the one I accidentally sent the proposal to Boeing. Because uh, I put the wrong email address in the But anyhow, so the trust brace wing came about. The nice thing about, the two nice things about the trust brace wing, it's light. And all else remaining equal, you can make your wing thinner, so you get less profile drag. Uh, the problem with the trust brace wing is interference drag. Um, and they've been working on that interference problem for a long time. Supposedly, they have it solved. Remains to be seen. Um, but it allows you to make a lighter structure, potentially a higher aspect ratio wing for the same weight, and get efficiencies. What's one of the challenges with really high aspect ratio wings? Yeah. Making them really, really, really long and at the same time fit. Fits what? The airport equivalent to the loading gauge. Yeah, yeah. You need to get into the airport. So that's always one of the challenges. We'll see. Like many of these NASA programs, they don't go anywhere. And that was about the time we were doing the, uh, actually I wasn't, but another guy I worked with at NASA um, who's since retired, was he would, his job was to take all these cool designs and compare them. And that was what the one of them was blending wing body, and it's just 
it didn't come out in the wash when you did start flying it over lots and lots of different missions. Um, so we'll see how that plays out. It's probably less, it's definitely less susceptible to those issues. Okay. So, if you all can join 3559015, we'll spend the rest of today talking about regulation. And while you're joining that, we'll start with question one. Wait, sir, am I allowed to use internet research to see what these two are? Which one? ACI and ICACAIA. Eh. I will tell you in just a second. So, we have the Civil Aviation Authority, the Federal Aviation Administration, the International... Civil Aviation Organization, thank you. Airports Council International, International Air Transport Association, International Coordinating Council on Aerospace Industries Association, the European Aviation Safety Authority, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Which one of these are regulatory bodies? So today, from today, it should be recorded. I say should be, because I haven't texted it. Um, Last week's one is No, no, they were not recorded because the way they were listed in the time table. Also, can I ask, also, once I've done this today, can I please, where, where, what are your office hours? Uh, aren't they? Yes. Um, okay. So that doesn't mean there won't be, I just aren't right now. Um, okay. So 35 of you have nicely responded. Let's see who you've, what you've said. So 85% have said FAA, 77% said EASA, 69% 71% said CAA, 39 ICAO, 27 IATA, 24 IKEA, IKEA, as they always pronounce it. Uh, And then less and less and less. Okay. So to answer this question, let's think about what a regulatory body does. A regulatory body, by definition, sets regulations. Regulations are law. So they have to have the ability to write law. Now, IATA, ICIA, and ACI are industry trade organizations. They can help write standards that might be used in law or referred to in law, but they don't write law. So these three, this is the International Air Transport Association, that's the airlines, that's the manufacturers, and ACI is the airports. They will influence the process. NASA. NASA writes no law. The only thing they have is policy for their own things they fly. Now, since manned space flight historically in North America and the US was the domain of NASA, they effectively had the ability to write law. Uh, you know, it was effectively created the same effect, but they don't write law. So now we're talking about these top ones. CAA. Is the UK's authority, they are the ones who issue the Air Navigation Order. The Air Navigation Order is what's called secondary legislation. It is law. The FAA, Federal Aviation Administration in the US, they write the FARs, Federal Aviation Regulations. 
Chapter 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Again, secondary legislation enabled by primary legislation. It's law. You break a FAR, you violate the ANO, you can go to prison. Some of the FARs, like disobeying a cabin crew member, they tell you to sit down and you refuse to, that's punishable in the U.S. by up to five years in federal penitentiary. Yep, just disobeying it. That's enough. That's a criminal offense. Follow me. And it's understandable. Yeah. Okay? That's not even doing anything beyond that. Assaulting one, they can go after air piracy. 25 years in the UK, minimum life in prison in the US. Now, you might get out in 20 years. That's the minimum sentence for conviction of air piracy. If you kill someone, the state will likely kill you. Um, okay, so these guys are definitely regulatory agencies. EASA. Now, EASA has a long history. It used to be the Joint Aviation Authorities. It was a coordinating <coughs> body. That was not regulatory. They didn't write law. All they did was come around, agree on something that everybody implemented. But then, with the creation of the modern European Union, they created EASA. So this is a regulatory authority now. Yeah? What do you say? What things are like, these like, laws? How do they change, like, kind of, like, way of flying over? Is it, like, potential by a promo to So... First law, primary law on a commercial flight is country of registration of the aircraft. So, for instance, if you are flying on a U.S. airline, no matter where you are in the world, they are not legally allowed to sell alcohol to you or give you alcohol if you're under the age of 20. However, if you were on a U.K. airline and you were over international waters or over the U.K., it's 18. However, as soon as you enter U.S. airspace, U.S. law applies. So, the airspace of the country you're flying over. Now, this creates all sorts of weird things. So, if you are flying over, say, U.S. territorial waters in a French registered aircraft and there is an accident, the U.S. will investigate. The moment you cross into international waters, becomes the domain of the merch. Okay? Now they do that. Okay. So these three are very clearly regulatory bodies. There's lots of other ones in the world. Transport Canada and Canada and the like. The odd one is ICAO. ICAO is a UN body. So it's part of the UN. It predates the UN. And its members are not all UN members, but it's part of the UN. ICAO is the people that write things like the noise, chapter 4 and chapter 41, noise, or emissions, or CO2, stuff like that. They're also the people that wrote the thing that shows why all the passports look like they do. Those little, the little letters on the bottom of your picture page, that's ICAO. The RFID chip, that's ICAO. They don't have any lawmaking authority. They can't say anything. They are a policy-making body. However, all ICAO members, as signing up to the treaty, the Chicago Convention, agree to implement those policies. But not all of them implement them the same way. So back in the days of Chapter 3 for noise regulations, which was a certification regulation, some countries just incorporated Chapter 3 as it was written. So Chapter 3 of Annex 2 to Volume 16 of the Chicago Convention or whatever it is, that's why it's called Chapters. Some countries implemented just said, see this paper, this document. Other countries said, ah, we're going to change the form. So they don't write it. But ICAO is a policy-making organization, and their policies generally end up as law, but they are not a regulatory organization. Okay? Okay. Next one. We have a document that provides assistance to you in meeting legal requirements. 
requirements, but is neither necessary nor automatically sufficient to meet those. What do we call that? This is, i.e., the path of least resistance. of you said guidance, 13% said policy, 8% said standard, and 0% correctly said regulation. Yes, it is guidance. So in CAA land, you'll hear about CAPs. So if you're doing UAVs, there's CAP 722, CAP 393. All that CAP 393 is, is a snapshot of what the air navigation order is. Your navigation order happens to be law, but it's not because it's 393 is law. It's a guidance document. It's meant to make it easier to read versus having to look at secondary legislation. Now, when you read a guidance document, you will see things like should. Should just means it suggested you do this. If you do this, it will make your life a little bit easier if, say, you fly your plane into a building. Right? Because I was doing that, it helps defend that I was intending to meet the law. You will also see the words must. If you see the word must, that means it goes back to some actual regulation. You must do X. You must do Y. So if you read the highway code, which by the way is not law, it's a guidance document, you will see should and must. Now the nice thing about the most recent, the highway codes that book everybody says to read about driving. The nice thing about the new, most recent versions of the Highway Code in the UK is when they say must, they now actually refer to the actual law. So you can see what the law says, because it's been, the wording's often been changed. Policy are just things we sh suggest as a government we're going to do, the things we've agreed to do. Standards we'll get to in just a second, because standards are really important, but we also often confuse those. Okay, what aspect of commercial civil aviation is a primarily approved by standards? Is it airframe, engines, airlines, airports, fuel, or runways? bit mean here, because all of you will probably have looked up ESS CS25 or CS Engine and thought, oh, great, certification standards. No, they are standards. They refer, you meet that standard, you will have met the regulation, because the regulation says this is a means of compliance. But, other countries don't use standards. The US has no standards for air freight engine airlines. You have to demonstrate you meet the intents and law of the regulation, and you can get alternate means to meet the regulation. That's a little bit 
parenting. The one thing that you will always see called out is fuel. And the reason for this is every airframe engine combination has to be certified. That includes the oil that lubricates it and the fuel that is burned. Which means, technically, we should have to certify the fuel that comes out of Stanlow Refinery that's used in Manchester Airport with every airframe engine combination versus the one that comes out of a refinery in Louisiana and another refinery in Louisiana that's blended together, put on a pipeline, and shipped to Atlanta. And the stuff that comes out of Japan and China. Think of all the pain and suffering that would cause. So what you will see is every aircraft and engine type certificate will call out a fuel that meets an ASTM standard. There's no law that says Gen A must meet X ASTM standard. But if it doesn't, then you, your fuel doesn't meet that standard. You have to go through the pain and suffering of getting certified on every single type certificate. Now, the problem is that ASTM standard is really, really tight. And it calls out all the way down to where the oil comes from. So certain oils are not allowed to be used in jet fuel because they haven't been verified. It used to say it had to come from fossils, which meant that you put any biofuel in an aircraft, it became an experimental aircraft. It no longer met certification requirements. Just because you hadn't put in and gotten it certified and it didn't meet the ASTM standard. So starting about 15 years ago, they started revising that standard to allow things like biofuel. There was one non-fossil oil source, and that was coal from certain refineries in South Africa that had been written into the law. So standards are really, really nice if you want to have lots of vendors that are work on it, lots of aircraft. Okay, the process of checking that all materials, components, and processes are as described is known as what in aviation? And this goes all the way back to the mine that the bauxite came from, the smelter that pulled the aluminium out of the bauxite, the forging plant, So certification is the process of saying that a design, an airframe, an engine, element, meets the requirements. Validation is this weird process where, say, the FAA says, looking at this, it meets our requirements. And then they say, they take that certificate over to the EASA or the CAA or vice versa. They say, see, your regulations are substantially the same as the FAA's. And they go, yes, they are. And yes, you actually have gotten it certified and won't give you the certification validated. 
Um, it just saves, instead of having to go through the process multiple times, it saves you that. In the validation process, there's also differences. For instance, EASA cares of... EASA cares about something called stall identification. Can the pilots identify without, you know, trying to think about it, that stall is about to happen? The FAA doesn't give a fly. They like stick shakers, but they don't want obvious, they don't need stall identification. It creates a difference in design things, so the FAA will sign it off, but EASA is the one that actually requires it. But that's certification and validation. Conformity is that process. I am conforming that that as-built thing is exactly what it says it is. Now, when you get an initial type certificate, you literally have to have the regulator conform every single aircraft or engine to that. It's what's called building on type certificate. So they will go and check. Now, usually what happens is there's a process by which they allow you to sign off that they do conform, <coughs> like lots of other things. But ultimately, your goal is to get your production process certified to say that your process will repeatedly produce a conforming aircraft. And that allows you to do it. Unfortunately, if you don't get that for a while, it's really expensive. Or if, say, you don't have a type certificate when you build a bunch of aircraft, and then it gets issued, or there's a a retrospective airworthiness directive while your aircraft are sitting on the ground, grounded and you're making modifications, you have to individually go back and do each aircraft. Very, very expensive. You know, Boeing for a while produced 40 ish 737 Maxes a month while they weren't flying. They had to individually conform all of those aircraft before delivery. Because the FAA no longer trusted Boeing, can't imagine why, the FAA insisted on doing it themselves. That's fine. The FAA doesn't charge you for it. But they don't have many people to do it. So there was, I think, three inspectors doing all the conforming. They could do about one aircraft a week. It takes a while. So you don't want to do that. OK. Very useful for you. What is the chapter number? And I use chapter. That's an FAA term. But the numbers are used the same. For large airframe certification regulations slash standards at FAA to the ASA. Is it 23, 25, 121, 33, E, or A? Just see who. Wow, change quickly. So seventy percent of you have said twenty-five. Yeah, it's far twenty-five. CS twenty-five is the large airframe. Twenty-three is smaller airframes. So if you have a design that's under, I think, nineteen passengers, like this jet or light. You have the ability to choose CS23, FAR23 in your thing. They are different. Theoretically, the standards are relaxed for these smaller aircraft. Because you're less likely to kill 200 people at once than other things. That's not always the case. Because there are expectations. They may be operated into places that are a bit more austere. austere. They, may, they do have some things. Like the takeoff regulation for 25 as a screen height 35 feet. That's what you have, the obstacle is at the end of the runway. It doesn't exist. The screen is clear. The takeoff regulation for FAR 20 and CS 23 is 50 feet. So you have to achieve. But once you clear that, you could for a while certify aircraft under FAR 23 that if you lost an engine would descend to the ground. It didn't need a positive rate of climb. Okay. E engines, that's 33 in FAA speak. 
121 is airline operations in the U.S. for the large airlines. Uh, I can't remember what A is, but they're all regulations. They all will pertain to your design, but they are not the primary one. So look at those uh, when you're doing it, because you assume that you're going to be operating this as an airline. Okay. Pretty simple regulations. The key thing with regulations is you need to consider them when you do your design. Um, you might also get dropped some question about regulations in context of other things. On the final. I'm not going to ask you to know what the regulation is for distance, maximum distance between emergency exits, or maximum number of passengers, depending on the type of emergency exit, or anything like that um, on an exam. You, know, you need to give me that in your design, maybe, but not an exam. If our aircraft is flying into a dry legislation, do we have to subtract the mass of its enormous booze holes? Get a more accurate weight fraction. Um, booze doesn't weigh that much. Uh, it's more than cigarettes. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no. Uh, looking at this week's reading volume, this course is titled Aircraft Performance and Design. Uh, it's, the, this week is, I don't expect you to read the regulations. I expect you to peruse them, to know what the titles are, and then to think about where to look for your design. Um, are airspace closures re regulations or standards? Um, there are different types of airspace closures. So, when you have a danger zone, or those type of things, or a temporary closure uh, restriction. Those are usually implemented via a regulation. Um, there are other things about it that are potentially standard with regulations. Uh, what regulations or standards do military aircraft need to meet, if any? Um, they will be different in each country. Um, they have, in the US, you'll hear about mil spec. Uh, which is military specification um, and the like, and there are other regulations. But tends, since they tend to be operated by governments, they tend to be governed by slightly different rules, um, and each country will be different. How is maximum landing weight determined for the sizing tool? The trick with maximum landing weight is you need to be able to land your maximum payload plus some fuel. So if your maximum payload is 25 tons, and your empty weight is 25 tons, and you decide that you need a little bit of fuel, use that. I use, as the first cut, the fuel just before landing on the maximum payload mission. You might decide to go higher for other reasons, right? So you don't do overweight landing. Some aircraft, small aircraft, often have maximum landing weights are the same as the Met M Tower, like a Cessna 172. Basically, you can take off, turn around, and land. Because very often, you fill it up because you want to fly it all day in the training, and the guy wants to do lots of touching. But commercial transport tends to be much less. Okay? Okay, guys. Um, I think we have done that. Uh, we're not going to really talk about legal stuff until we get to environmental and safety again for a while. Okay? Thanks, guys. Hopefully the podcast will work, and I will get the notice, and it will go up, and I'll make it available as soon as